describe uh, some joint work over the last uh, year or so uh, with various collaborators, Dan Fried, Davide Gaiotto, Dmitry Galikov, Tom Maniro, Greg Moore, and Pietro Longhi. Um, and so, okay, so, so what is the subject? Um, so the subject uh, is, so last year um, in, in joint work, um, originally with Davide Gaiotto and Greg Moore, um, actually as part of a kind of a long running collaboration, we've been studying um, uh, N equals two supersymmetric field theories uh, in four dimensions. Um, and in the process of, uh, of that study, um, so it, it's a question from physics, but it led uh, to some construction, which is just a sort of mathematical geometric construction, which is this notion of spectral network. Um, and so what is a spectral network? So I'll describe for you how they're constructed you know, in a couple of slides, but just as, to get some vague idea of what kind of object we're talking about, we're gonna have a, a two manifold C, which often we think of as a Riemann surface, but not always. Um, and we're gonna draw a bunch of paths on that Riemann surface. So here's a picture of a patch of a Riemann surface, and as you can see, we've got some complicated network of paths drawn on it. Um, as well as, uh, so here you see some paths and also some branch cuts. So those are branch cuts uh, uh, representing uh, um, uh, the branching of some uh, finite cover of the Riemann surface, in this case a three to one cover. So we're gonna have a finite branch cover of our Riemann surface, and we're gonna have some, a bunch of paths on the Riemann surface, um, which are gonna be decorated by some discrete data, these numbers, um, which are actually just labeling the sheets of this covering, um, and the, these paths are gonna obey some kind of, uh, some local rules. Um, and so, so my aim today is to describe, first of all, to say more precisely what a spectral network actually is, um, Second, to, and, and then to explain sort of two of the uses of spectral networks. So one of the uses is that spectral networks, uh, as I'll explain, are related to, well, what in physics we would call BPS states, or um, uh, what in math you would call um, DT invariants, or really, to be, to be more precise, I just really say generalized DT invariants. Um, so spectral networks provide some sort of particularly computable examples of this general notion of Donaldson thomas invariant. Um, and I'll also describe um, uh, a, a recent surprise that came out of, um, of using spectral networks to study these things. When I say it's a surprise, it was, it was certainly a surprise um, for physics, as I'll try to explain. Perhaps it won't be such a surprise for the mathematicians, actually. Um, and then the, the second use of spectral networks that I want to try to describe is an application, sort of it, it seems, it, it, uh, it seems sort of a priori unrelated to this stuff about DT invariants. Um, it's, it's just the question of studying the moduli of flat GLKC connections on a two manifold, studying the character variety. Um, and uh, so spectral networks provide a very convenient way of, very roughly speaking, replacing these non-abelian sort of complicated sounding uh, uh, GLK connections with actually just GL1 connections. Um, so abelianizing the connections uh, not on the original manifold, but on some k-fold cover of the manifold. Um, so I'll describe uh, how that works. Um, and so, you know, very roughly speaking, any question about a non-abelian connection gets replaced by some hopefully easier question about an abelian one. Um, so for two manifolds, that's part of what um, that's part of the the story that we developed with uh, um, Gato and Moore last year. And now, um, very recently, in joint work with Dan Fried we are trying to develop the three-manifold version of this, um, which has to do with Chern-Simons theory. Um, so that's my aim, these three things. Um, so let's see how we do. Okay, so first, spectral networks. What is a spectral network, actually? Okay, so spectral network is something that you construct uh, out of some data, um, and the data is pretty simple. So, so um, let's say that we're given a curve. Which, so now let me think of C really as a complex curve, a, a Riemann surface, compact Riemann surface. Um, and suppose that I'm also given just a k-fold branch covering of it, uh, so sigma a k to one covering over C, and sigma is not an abstract covering, but it lives in the, the cotangent bundle, the holomorphic cotangent bundle of C. So suppose I'm given just that data. Um, well, you know, I could think a little more concretely about that data, um, you know, locally, um, locally on, on C, you know, say I'm sitting at, say, this point of the curve, then I look at the three sheets of this covering, in general, K sheets here, three sheets of this covering. Um, you know, each one of them is living inside the cotangent bundle, and it's a it's a complex submanifold. So locally, what it gives me is just a holomorphic uh, one form. So locally, here I have 
you know, around any point of the curve, I have just k holomorphic one forms. And I could label them lambda 1 up to lambda k, but of course that label doesn't have a global meaning because when I move around the Riemann surface, there will be some monodromy that permutes the different, uh, uh, these different forms. And particularly at the branch points, um, the branch points of this covering, which I'm marking by kind of orange crosses here, um, at the branch points, um, you know, these forms are uh, uh, colliding with each other. Um, uh, that's the point where two of them become equal. OK, so, so that's going to be our data. Well, actually, more exactly, um, it'll be convenient to look at a little extension of this so we'll allow the covering to go off to infinity at some places in the cotangent bundle. And so concretely speaking, I just mean that my, my locally defined one forms, instead of being holomorphic, they'll be meromorphic. They'll have some poles. Um, that sounds like it would make the story worse, but it actually makes it better. It's very convenient to have at least one of these poles, as we'll see. Um, so let's suppose that we have that data. Um, well, I said that this has something to do with physics, so I should, I should at least indicate what kind of physics this is about. So um, fixing this curve, the data of just the base curve, actually together with the defects, um, that determines for us a particular n equals 2 supersymmetric quantum field theory in four dimensions. That it's the, the general class of these theories. Sometimes people say they call them theories of class S. So there's a theory of class S. Theory of class S depends on two data, uh, a curve, which is here, the defects, which I didn't write explicitly, and the choice of an ADE Lie algebra, which in this case is sort of AK, is AK minus 1, K being the number of sheets of this covering. Um, so, so, OK, so, um, uh, and so that's, that's so the, the quantum field theory is determined just by the base curve. And then in addition to the base curve, we have this covering. And the choice of the covering determines a, uh, um, a point on the Coulomb branch of this quantum field theory, some kind of moduli space which is associated to the quantum field theory. Um, actually, one way of thinking about it, for those who like to think about the Hitchin system, this Coulomb branch is just the base of the Hitchin system. Um, and so in particular, given a Higgs bundle, you would get one of these coverings. OK, anyway, so, so um, we're just giving ourselves um, a Riemann surface and a covering of it, which, which is living in the cotangent bundle. OK. And now suppose we have that data. Um, now I'm going to define for you some gadget, which uh, we call the spectral network. So, so the spectral network depends on all the data I just told you, which is just a curve and a covering. Um, but then also on one other thing, a, a phase, just a parameter, uh, call it theta. And then we're going to make a network, and here's how we make it. So the, 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 the paths in this network I'm going to call walls. Um, OK, so first of all, the walls are going to be trajectories of some differential equation. Um, remember, our curve. Um, this covering sort of endowed the curve with a bunch of locally defined uh, holomorphic one forms. And so given those holomorphic one forms, lambda 1 up to lambda k, um, I can formulate a differential equation that just says z dot equals e to the i theta, or sorry, more precisely, lambda i minus lambda j, z dot equals e to the i theta. So that's a differential equation that determines a, a kind of trajectory on the curve. Well, really, a bunch of different kinds of trajectories, because for every choice of i and j, I can define a trajectory in this way. Um, so each wall will be carrying a label ij, which tells you um, which equation it solves. Um, OK. That didn't define the network. That's just a characteristic that this network is going to have. Um, so to start making the network, what we do is we start by looking at the branch points of the covering. So each branch point is a place where exactly two of, the, two of these um, one forms are coming together. Um, so where lambda i becomes equal to lambda j. And in fact, there's monodromy around that branch point where lambda i and lambda j are exchanged. Now, if you look at the structure of these trajectories, the trajectories of this equation, um, in a neighborhood of the branch point, um, what you find is that they have this kind of bifurcated structure. Actually, let me draw a picture of that whole bifurcated structure. Oh, where's the chalk? Ah. Um, so you know, the picture of what the trajectories look like around that branch point Uh, something like this. So the trajectories are kind of going like this around the branch point. And so in particular, there's three kind of distinguished trajectories, which are the ones which actually run straight into the branch point, which is actually a singularity of this equation. So the, runs, the ones that run straight into that singularity are somehow distinguished. 
And in building this spectral network, um, we're going to start by taking those three trajectories. So around every branch point, there's three distinguished trajectories. Um, and we'll have those, tra those three trajectories uh, um, born at the branch point, so to speak. They emerge from the branch point, And then they just flow according to this differential equation. And they go wherever they go, um, running around the surface. So you sort of evolve them for infinite time. You let them run around the surface forever. Except for one more thing. Ah, OK, now, because of some incompatibility, the very bottom of my slides is being cut off. And you see one example of that here. So, 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 so these are two trajectories, um, a trajectory of type ij and a trajectory of type jk. They're solutions of differential equation, but different equations. So they're not leaves of a single global foliation. There's no reason why they can't cross. And at the moment when they cross, my, our rule for defining this network is that if a, if a trajectory of type ij crosses a trajectory of type jk, then they give birth to another trajectory born right at the intersection point, which is of type ik. Um, so, so far, this definition might sound kind of nuts, but it's a perfectly reasonable definition. Um, uh, it's a perfectly well-defined definition. Um, so then you just evolve them for infinite time. This one could cross some other ones and give birth to new children and, and so on. So it's potentially a very kind of, it's not obviously a very finitary kind of process. But anyway, that's what you do. So, so, so that defines, this procedure defines our network, um, spectral network. Uh, OK, so, um, so we better see some sample of this. So, so, um, so here's, here's an example where I took my curve to be CP1. Um, I put three defects, so three singularities of my covering. And then I have some threefold covering over that CP1 with six branch points. And where is the picture? OK, here's the picture. So you see, you start from the, um, you start from the branch points. You shoot out these trajectories. Um, and then you just evolve them, uh, um, evolve them for infinite time. Um, and you see that uh, you know, in practice, this leads to some, OK, it's a slightly co complicated looking structure. But on the other hand, it, it's, uh, um, you know, it's somehow, you can imagine that this is actually a kind of combinatorial object. You, know, you can keep track of where everything intersects and so on. Um, so it's just some combinatorial picture which is drawn on the surface um, by, by this procedure. OK. Um, so, uh, OK, so just to summarize where we are so far, given a curve and a covering of that curve living inside its cotangent bundle, maybe with some singularities. Um, Oh, very good. So, so yeah. So my rule for the rule for when they for when they give birth to children is so if I have an IJ one and a JK one, they gave birth to an IK one. But for example, what may happen is what you have there might be like one two and one three crossing. Those don't give birth to anything. Um, it's exactly the rules for and really the way to you know uh, somehow the origin of these rules is the, the, the root system of GLK. So think of if you have two, the roots of GLK are naturally labeled by pairs like this. The root IJ and the root JK, their sum is another root, which is IK. And that's somehow the origin of this rule. These two roots, on the other hand, don't sum to another root. And so I'm not doing anything there. Um, OK, so, 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 um, so, so I've defined this kind of complicated sounding picture. But, but anyway, it's canonically associated to the data that I started with. OK. Um, so maybe it's worth saying, so this, this example was the example of a triple cover. Um, so the case uh, k equals 3 in my notation. Um, there's one case of this which is particularly simple, which is the case k equals 2. So in the case k equals 2, these kind of crossings never occur. Um, and they don't occur for a simple reason. If you look back at the equation that uh, the trajectory is obeyed, um, in that case, um, all of the trajectories, they're either of type 1, 2, or 2, 1. And both of those are actually leaves of a single global foliation. Um, so in that case, it's impossible for the trajectories to cross. And you can imagine that that's going to make this thing much, much simpler. Um, and indeed, in this case, um, this network that I'm defining um, is actually an object which has been studied for a long time in mathematics. It's, it's the, called the critical graph of a quadratic differential. Um, and so Strabel studied you know, the, the trajectories of this differential equation that I was writing. They're called the trajectories of a quadratic differential. And Strabel has a whole book where this is exhaustively explored. It's a very interesting subject. Um, so what we have here is some kind of higher rank generalization of this classical theory of trajectories of quadratic differentials, 
which is, of course, much, much less studied. I mean, there are basically no theorems. I, I'm telling you, I'm showing you sort of representative examples. Um, and we think we understand the behavior, but there are basically no theorems about it yet. OK. Um, OK, so, so, so so far I defined for you spectral network, but so far there's no indication that they're good for anything. So let me start um, trying to use them for something. And so let me start with this, this uh, claim I made that they have something to do with the counting of BPS states. OK. So, so suppose now that I fix my covering, um, but I let this parameter theta vary. So I had a phase parameter in the definition of the trajectories. And suppose that I allow that parameter to vary. Um, so as we do that, this network is going to change. Um, so here's an example from the case k equals 2. So this is the simple case where the walls never cross. And as I vary this parameter theta, you see that, um, well, the thing just deforms by kind of isotopy. But then at some critical moments, here comes one now, bang, suddenly the topology of the thing jumps. And uh, at the moment when it jumps, the jump is sort of can be blamed on uh, a very sp a special trajectory. Here comes another one on the right side. Right here. Bang. The ah, yeah. The topology of the thing suddenly jumps. Um, so the moments when it jumped ha are exactly the moments when the trajectory appears, which just goes straight from one branch point into the other one. Or said otherwise, it's the place where two trajectories hit each other head to head. The trajectory emerging from one branch point and the trajectory emerging from the other. So at that moment, Exactly at the critical moment, you see this special trajectory, which is connecting two critical points. And so in this picture, there are two such trajectories. So I've drawn them over here. I've redrawn here these three branch points, which were here. One of the special trajectories just goes like this, and the other special trajectory just goes like this. Um, so OK, so that's some sort of critical phenomenon associated with these pictures. It's the moments when it jumps. And it's associated with some degenerate, degeneration of the picture. Um, so in this example, there were just two such degenerations. So I could say there's an invariant number two, which counts those degenerations, if you like. Um, OK. Let's see, let's see another one. So this is, a, this is a similar thing. It's actually on the same moduli space as the other one. It's, it's, I took that quadratic, I took that uh, covering and just deformed it a little bit without changing its asymptotics. I still have three branch points. Um, but now we're going to see three jumps instead of two, corresponding to just the three edges of the sort of obvious triangle here. So there are the three. Um, special trajectories. You see the picture jump one time, two times, and here comes three times. OK, so, so these objects, so these objects, as I said, this is the case of trajectories of a quadratic differential. And these objects are also just classically studied objects. They're called saddle connections, um, or geodesics in some natural flat metric with cone singularities at, the, at those branch points. Um, so those are kind of classically studied things. Um, Oh, yeah, here's another thing that happens. OK, this one's a little more interesting. So, so up till now, I was drawing the pictures always on the plane. But now we'll have one on the cylinder. Um, or if you like, CP1 with singularities at the two infinities. And here, well, OK, here you see something quite complicated happen. So the picture is that we have two branch points, um, two branch points, one here and one here. Each one is emitting three trajectories. Um, and then, uh, those trajectories can hook up with each other in many, many ways because they can wind around the cylinder arbitrarily many times. And so you see an infinite set of these saddle connections um, for the infinite number of uh, windings that you can have. And then you see yet a further thing. Right at the critical moment, there's actually closed trajectories. So that's what I'm drawing over here. Uh, the trajectory from here, the trajectory coming out of uh, this one is just going around the cylinder and hooking up with itself. So that's another thing that can happen. And you see it's some more complicated thing from the point of view of these spectral networks. Um, it's also a classically studied thing, the, the closed trajectories of quadratic differentials. OK? Um, just one more of these. I'm not going to show you just catalog forever. Um, here's, here's an example wh where, the, where k is 3. So this is something new. This, this is not part of the theory of quadratic differentials. Here we have a spectral network, which the topology is going to jump right there. Um, so you see there's this little triangle in the middle that shrinks. And then the picture, then the topology of the whole network jumps. Uh, so that's associated with the appearance of a slightly more complicated object. It's not just a single trajectory that runs between two things. What it really is is this kind of three-string junction. 
Um, so the thing that appears at exactly at the critical moment is this three-string junction that I've drawn over here. Um, so OK, so this I want to think of as some generalization of the usual things that you count in the theory of quadratic differentials. OK. Um, OK, fine. So, so there are these, these jumps. Um, so what does it have to do with BPS counts? So, so um, as part of this work with Gato and Moore, um, we defined a map. Um, it's actually not just a single integer, but it's an integer for every homology class of the spectral curve. So each one of those degenerations has some associated homology class on the spectral curve. Um, and we define an integer which just counts the, counts the degenerations in a, uh, in a given homology class. Counts in an appropriate sense. So I'll come back to exactly what counts means. Um, but first, the interpretation. So the interpretation is that these numbers, first of all, they are the counts of BPS states um, in this quantum field theory that I, that I mentioned. Um, and so in the case k equals 2, this is more or less something that had been known before by Clem, Lersch, Meyer, Waffe, and Werner. Um, for the higher rank, uh, it's, as far as I know, something new. Um, uh, so, so, um, so what are some examples of the rules? So for example, this saddle connection, which was my most basic example, just counts as 1. Um, this tripod thing, this three-string network, also counts as 1. These closed trajectories, so if you have we had actually a whole annulus of closed trajectories, which is bounded by two um, closed trajectories ending on branch points. So this is the picture that we had on the cylinder. This one actually counts omega equals minus 2 when you work it out. Um, OK, so these are some, some BPS numbers, some numbers that are attached to the quantum field theory that you construct using these spectral networks. Um, so on the one hand, they're BPS state counts. Um, on the other hand, uh, um, or just equivalently, the BPS state counts are also supposed to have some sort of purely geometric meaning, so if you don't care about quantum field theory. Um, and what they're supposed to be is they're supposed to be the Donaldson-Thomas invariants, or generalized Donaldson-Thomas invariants, attached to the Fukaya category of a particular Calabi-Yau threefold. OK, what's the Calabi-Yau threefold? So my data is, is, um, was a curve, um, a complex curve and a Lie group. And the, this Calabi-Yau threefold is you take your curve and you take a C2 mod ZK singularity fibered over that curve. Um, and then you have to deform it to make it smooth. And the, de the deformation, the parameters determining, the, determining that deformation are the same as the parameters that determine my covering. Um, uh, so we have some, some Calabi-Yau threefold here, um, which was, this Calabi-Yau was written down you know, for yeah, essentially the same reason by, by Diakonescu and Danaghi and, and Pantev, although it was also in that work of in some form, it was also in that work of Klim, Lersch, Meyer, Waffe, and Werner. Um, and these generalized DT invariants, of course, have been studied by many people. So you know, Douglas, Bridge, Lincoln, Savage, Soibelman, uh, Joyce, and Song. So those two really defined it. Um, and then in this particular context, this particular Calabi-Yau, um, in the case k equals 2, this story is really has been made precise by, um, uh, by Bridge, Lincoln, and Smith. OK, so, so sorry. So what's the point of this? So, so um, the point is, this is actually something concrete that you can really understand. Um, so the picture is that um, so the objects that I was that I was drawing um, were some kind of uh, you know paths on my paths or networks of paths on my curve. This calabi out threefold is fibered over that curve, and the picture is that there's supposed to be for every one of these objects which we counted, there's supposed to be actually some special Lagrangian objects sitting upstairs in the calabi out threefold. So here I'm drawing kind of the simplest picture. If I just have a single uh, saddle connection like this. That's supposed to correspond to a special Lagrangian three-sphere, um, which you make by taking a two-sphere in each fiber over this thing. Um, and the two-sphere is collapsing at the two ends. So it makes up a, a three-sphere in the, in the covering. So that's the kind of naive tropical picture of what these things are supposed to, how the correspondence is supposed to go. Um, OK. OK, so these, so these objects are supposed to lift to some special Lagrangian three cycles. So if your interest is in DT invariance, Think of these spectral networks as some tropical device which allows you to study the Fukaya category of this non-compact Calabi-Yau threefold. OK. Well, OK, so the minus, you know, so I'm not a guy who's an expert on these generalized DT invariants. Um, I mean, I think the idea is that you have an object which, you have an object which has a moduli space. So, so in, here it was an S3. The other object, the object corresponding to that closed loop is going to have the topology of S2 cross S1. Um, it, it, no, no, the picture is a little bit different. So, you, yeah, let me not try to say it now. But the, the, 
the topology of that object is going to be S2 cross S1. So you have a moduli space to deal with there. Um, when you relate this to a quiver category, you understand that that moduli space is really uh, just CP1. And you're getting essentially the Euler characteristic of CP1, but with this tricky sign thrown in. Um, in directly in the case of the special Lagrangians, I'm not sure exactly how to say it. I mean, other experts here could say it much better than me. But, but the, answer is, the answer is going to be minus 2. Uh, OK. Uh, yeah, maybe it's just that. Uh, yeah, that's right. I, yeah, presumably, it, somehow it should be that. But uh, okay. So okay. So so um. So all right. So so that's that's one of the uses of these spectral networks is that they're supposed to be related to this uh, uh, these DT invariants. Um, but we got what was for us a surprise um, recently. So. So I showed you pictures of sort of a couple of the most basic degenerations and the rules for, for counting them. And you know, that would lead you, just looking at these things would lead you to believe that these invariants are always going to be pretty tame and kind of well under control. Um, and that's certainly what we thought. Also from the point of view of physics, it was very natural to believe that in these quantum field theories, you'll never get any kind of really crazy numbers appearing here. It'll always be something pretty tame. Um, so that turned out to be wrong. So, so so in this joint work with Galikov, uh, Longy, Maniro, and, and more, um, we started exploring sort of a little more you know, what kind of degenerations can occur. We were looking for something that would give a higher spin state from the point of view of physics. Um, and so we came across this one. Um, so well, there it is. So the, the blue, red, and, and purple correspond to the, the three different kinds of paths. So there are type 1, 2, 2, 3, and uh, um, and 1, 3. And you study some complicated uh, uh, spectral network, and you find a degeneration where the locus along which the thing degenerates looks like this. And now you apply. So as I said, there's some algorithm for determining the DT invariance attached to any one of these pictures. And so you look at this picture, and you say, well, what do you get? First, you do it on a computer. The computer can do it. And what you get is this. So, for every previous one, though I didn't emphasize it, I just got a single non-zero invariant. Um, but this one actually leads to an infinite sequence of non-zero invariants. So here are the first few. 3 minus 6, 18 minus 84, 465, and so on. Um, so not only, you know, not only is there an infinite sequence of them, um, but they actually are growing exponentially fast. Um, so if you look at how they grow as a function of, as a, as a function of the charge, as a function of this n, um, well, it has essentially exponential growth. The constant you can determine, so the bottom of my slide, as I say, has been cut off. And so the bottom of the slide tells you what that constant is. Um, it's the log, I mean, who cares? But just to show you that there's some definite number, the log of 256 divided by 27. Um, so you get an exponential growth of these uh, uh, DT invariants. Um, well, OK. So what's the meaning of it? I have no idea. You, you, you can, um, I don't understand the meaning of the leading term either. I mean, you just construct this sequence, and you determine what its asymptotics are, and these are, their, these are its asymptotics. Um, uh, but, uh, but indeed, OK, so, so, so let me say a little bit about the physics of this. So, so you know, OK, so I, I, I showed you that abstract picture. Um, I showed you this abstract picture, um, but you know it's not just an abstract picture. It really occurs in an actual concrete example of these spectral networks. And it's almost the simplest thing you could imagine. So you just take the curve to be CP1, you take the group to be A2, so a threefold cover, um, and you put some singularities at zero and infinity. Um, in physics, it corresponds to almost the simplest theory for which the answer was not yet known. So just n equals 2 supersymmetric Yang mills, almost the first theory you write down when you start studying n equals 2 supersymmetric field theories. Um, it was like the second one studied, Cyberger Witten studied the SU2 theory. And like the very next thing that people did was study the SU3 theory. Um, they just didn't work out the BPS spectrum completely. Um, so the statement is that this you know, very benign sounding quantum field theory um, actually has exponential growth in its spectrum of BPS states, which for physicists, uh, it's kind of unexpected. I mean, it, naively speaking, it would mean that the theory has some kind of Hagedorn-type behavior. Um, 
I don't know of any reason why it can't be true. In our paper, we discussed sort of some arguments which would suggest that you cannot have such a growth, and we discussed loopholes in those arguments. As far as I know, there's no physical reason why it can't happen. But on the other hand, if you polled physicists, I think certainly we would have said that it, it probably doesn't happen. So that seems to be wrong. Um, so you know, nothing like this happened in SU2. In SU2, Cyber, Witten, and Bilal Ferrari had worked out the whole spectrum. Um, and you get nothing like this. So, so somehow it seems that going just from SU2 to SU3 makes the story just drastically more interesting and, and more complicated or worse. Yes, but I mean, this is not like at the superconformal point. I mean, this is at some generic point of the Coulomb branch. It's true that those two things happened at the same time, but I mean, there's plenty of superconformal theories that don't have this behavior. I mean, you know, uh, um, I mean, you can do like the SU2 theory with some flavors or something, and that has superconformal points, but it, but it doesn't have this. So it. So no, I mean, I I, I, I know. Okay, it's just a fact. In five D gauge theories, I'm prepared to believe it. Yeah. Uh, but uh, but still, this seems, yeah. Um, yeah. But for four-dimensional gauge theories, it's something uh, for me surprising. Uh, okay. So let me skip that. Um, so let me uh, no. Let me see. So in in supergravity theories, this would not have been a surprise. In supergravity theories, you expect exponential growth because of black hole entropy. But in field theory, it's quite another story. Okay. So. So this answer kind of bothered us. Um, so we actually did check it another way. So um, the, I mean, there's another way you can try to get at these answers, which is um, one of the very important things about these Donaldson-Thomas invariants is that they obey a kind of wall crossing formula. So um, you fix your base curve C, but you imagine moving the covering, so change the covering. Um, then these invariants are supposed to change. Um, they really depend on the covering. We saw an example of that even in my little pictures. Sometimes it was two, and sometimes it was three in one of the examples. But they change in a way that's completely under control. It's this wall crossing formula. Um, so, so it's one of the fundamental things about these DT invariants. So studied by Deneff and Moore, by Kinsevich Soibelman, by Joyce and Song, in physics by Deneff and Moore and by us, by Manshat Peely and Sen, and by other people as well. Um, uh, so because we know that formula, we can use it to try to sort of check this result. And in fact, you can start from a place, you can start from a covering uh, where you, where there are only 12 non-zero invariants, and they're just equal to 1. That corresponds to this particular spectral network that I'm drawing here, which looks you know, very well under control, nothing too crazy going on. Um, and then you start, from that, you start from that sigma, you vary sigma, you cross a couple of walls, and sure enough, you see this exponential, exponentially growing spectrum. So, so it seems to be really there. OK. Um, uh, that's what it says in the cutoff part at the bottom. You vary sigma across a couple of walls and use wall crossing to see this exponentially growing spectrum. All right. Um, so, yeah. Do you have an idea of what the quantum numbers are? By, sorry, what do you mean by quantum numbers? Oh, you mean the spins? Um, yeah, so the, the, the spectral network thing doesn't give you the spins, but the, uh, um, the wall crossing formula has a motivic version, which certainly does give you the spins. Um, we have a bunch of information about that in the paper. I don't have it in my, uh, uh, I don't have it in RAM. But yes, you can determine all that stuff. Uh, oh, the dionic charges for sure. So, so I mean that that gamma that I was writing, that gamma is the dionic charge. So yeah, I should have emphasized that. What we're studying here is just the multiples of a single charge. So it's not the whole spectrum. It's just the guys along a single ray in charge space. Um, that degenerate spectral network corresponds to one particular ray in charge space. Um, but even that ray has very complicated behavior. And in fact, there's similar behavior along many, many other rays. Um, OK. So, so that sounds like kind of bad news you know, uh, in a certain sense. I mean, gauge theories just have in them these impossibly complicated numbers uh, um, generated by some mysterious procedure. Um, but actually, at the same time as you discover this problem, um, you also kind of learn um, uh, you learn that there is some structure there. So, so here again are these crazy numbers that we were getting. Um, and suppose that you organize them into a generating function in this way. So um, there's a generating function p of z that contains all of these numbers omega of n gamma. Um, well, as it turns out, um, this, uh, um, as it turns out, this generating function actually obeys, and it's determined by, um, uh, a pretty simple algebraic equation, just this equation here. 
Um, and so, you know, I first said that these BPS numbers are something kind of crazy and complicated, but from this point of view, um, there's actually something very simple. Um, and so this equation, we didn't invent this equation. This equation was discovered in sort of a different but basically isomorphic context by Kinsevich, by Kinsevich and was discussed by Gross, uh, Gross Ponder. Uh, who is it? Um, Seabird, yeah, <laughs> not sorry, moment. Uh, gross ponder, 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 and Seabird. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, yeah, GPS. So, um, uh, so, but what's 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 cool about this story is that the, this sort of spectral network algorithm for computing the BPS spectrum, at the same time as it produces for you the spectrum, it actually also produces a kind of natural explanation of this equation. Um, so, so these equations. Um, uh, somehow arise, arise naturally um, when you start uh, studying the BPS spectrum in this particular way. And so we believe that that's going to be a general story, that the BPS spectra in any theory of class S um, will always be determined by these kind of algebraic equations um, and for, for similar kind of reason. So, um, so somehow this seems to be, you know, when you go to the higher rank theories, it seems that the right way of organizing the spectrum is really to find these equations rather than to find the, the numbers. I don't know. Um, yeah, that's a natural question. Um, I don't know. Uh, yeah, I have nothing to say about that. Um, well, the physical meaning of it, I mean, I can show you what it means in terms of the, the spectral network. I mean, the spectral network has to do with solitons living on some surface defects. And so this equation just comes from the sort of local rules um, for how those solitons, for, for essentially the wall crossing for those two-dimensional solitons. Um, so, it, it comes from that, but the meaning of, if you ask me what's the meaning of literally this equation, the meaning of that power four there, I don't have anything to say. I mean, it, it comes from the soliton thing, but then you do some further processing. And so, so no, I can't, I don't know a very simple way of starting from the statement that I'm doing the SU3 theory and immediately just writing down this equation. It would be very interesting to, to understand concretely uh, uh, sort of why it's exactly this equation that appears. Um, we're trying to get more examples of these equations from sort of more complicated spectral networks, but it's not an easy, so far it's not an easy thing. Okay. Um, oh, so, so, so I should say that Kinsevich um, has conjectured and in fact I think proved um, very generally that DT invariants obey that kind of equation. Um, so these equations really should be there, um, but the spectral network seems to give a concrete way of getting them. Uh, yeah. Yeah, the, the, oh, a combinatorial interpretation of this? The conditions of P. Yes, you know, if you type this sequence into, so if you type the sequence of coefficients of P into the OEIS, you get like 100 different things. <laughs> um, I, I can't remember them now. I, none of them were directly useful to us. But yes, these sequences, in fact, that's how we first learned that we were on the right track, is we typed the sequences that we were getting into OEIS, and we found these equations. And so. um, yeah. Okay, so so. Um, uh, okay, so let me just say there's an, there's another approach to this kind of BPS counting, which goes not by the geometry of spectral networks or anything, but rather through quiver representations. Um, and so you know, spectral networks give you the same as quivers in in cases that have been studied by both methods. Um, and so from that point of view, this exponentially growing spectrum that I was just describing is related to something that people who study quivers know very well, which is that if you study the, the DT invariants associated to the Kronecker quiver with three arrows, they have this kind of crazy growth. Um, so that's, um, so in that form, these things have been studied before. Um, and incidentally, the, the SU3 theory, it doesn't just have the Kronecker 3 quiver, it has the Kronecker M quiver for any M, as it turns out. Um, so even worse stuff. Uh, um, if you go to different points of the moduli space. Okay. Okay, so that was all about the first application um, uh, of spectral networks to BPS state counting. Um, and so, you know, in the balance of my time, let me try to tell you about the other application um, uh, to this uh, abelianization. Okay. Um, so, so at least initially, let me not try to motivate the physics of this problem. Let me just say, what's the mathematical problem? So, so imagine that you've got your curve um, with some marked points, and you want to study the moduli of flat connections over that curve, the so-called character variety. Um, it's a sort of interesting, well-studied space. 
Um, well, to be precise, not, not just flat connections over the curve, but flat connections over the curve which have singularities at these marked points. So they can have the simplest kind of singularity, you would just have uh, some monodromy around the marked point. Um, so let's suppose we're in that situation. Um, and now, here's an a priori unrelated thing. We have some covering of our curve, a k to 1 covering, that's sigma. Just remind you, so our picture is that we have sigma covering c, k to 1 covering. So we could study GLK connections down here, or we could study GL1 connections up here. Um, flat connections down here, flat, actually I wrote almost flat, they should have holonomy minus 1 around the branch points, but basically forget it, flat connections. Um, here they, on C they had singularities at the marked points, here they'll have singularities at the pre-images of the marked points. Um, okay, so, so natural question, maybe natural question, how are these two kinds of connection related to one another? A billion thing downstairs, a billion thing upstairs, not a billion thing downstairs. Well, OK, so that, you know, there's a naive guess for what you could do to relate them. Um, the obvious thing you could imagine doing is, you know, I've, suppose I've got a flat connection over my covering, a flat abelian connection over my covering. Um, what could I do? I could just take the push forward of it. So what does the push forward mean? So you know, here I've got my point z. I want to give you a bundle over z. So what's the fiber of that bundle? It's just the direct sum of the fibers um, uh, the fibers of my abelian bundle upstairs. So here I have rank 1 vector spaces, three of them. And so the direct sum will just be a rank 3 vector space downstairs. So that's the push forward bundle. Nothing fancy. Um, well, that thing, of course, carries a push forward connection. So if I have a path, oh, sorry, the bottom of this has been cut off, and that's actually very important. So uh, under this <laughs> is the curve C. And suppose we have a path on the curve C. So that path should be labeled, you know, call it P. Um, suppose I want to do the parallel transport along this path from one fiber to another. Well, the fiber here was just the direct sum of these. The fiber here is just the direct sum of these. So I could do parallel transport of my abelian connection along these three paths and just take the sum. That's sort of the most naive thing you can do. That gives you a perfectly good par uh, parallel transport operator, which, I'll, which you call, sorry, this should be, the star should be down, so it's the push forward of Nabla Ebb. Um, it's just, so if you write it relative to the obvious kind of local bases, it would just be given by diagonal matrix, whose diagonal entries are the, um, uh, the abelian connection on the three sheets. OK, so that's a way of taking a connection upstairs and making a connection downstairs. The problem with it um, is that it only, lives over, or, or, it only lives over the complement of the branch points. Um, and it really cannot be extended to the whole curve. Why can it not be extended to the whole curve? Just because it has monodromy around the branch point. So if I go around a path that begins and ends at the same point, goes around, to, goes around a branch point, um, that path um, will lift to an open path, well, to two open paths. Here's just one of them, um, which begins and ends at different points. So, um, so the monodromy of this covering just induces a monodromy of the push forward connection. If I wrote a matrix representing this, this parallel transport, it would not be the identity. In fact, it would not even be diagonal. It would be strictly off diagonal. So, so OK, so the push forward just doesn't give you a connection over the whole C because of some problem around the branch points. OK, but I want to construct flat connections over the whole curve C. Um, so what will I do? Well, so, OK, so of course, the gadget which allows you to get around this problem uh, is exactly one of these spectral networks. Um, so now I want to define for you a new connection downstairs uh, on, on C. So I'll call it Nabla. And I have to give you the parallel transport along some path. The parallel transport along some path, say this path, how about this path? It, it'll be the parallel transport of this push forward, this naive thing that I first said. So that's what I wrote here, the parallel transport of the push forward. Um, except that when my path crosses a wall, so here at this moment, my path is crossing one of the walls of the spectral network. And at that moment, I'm going to splice in an additional matrix. And this matrix will not be diagonal. It's not diagonal. On the other hand, it just has a single off-diagonal entry. And that off-diagonal entry, yeah, only non-zero entry is in the ij position. So this wall is carrying label ij. And that tells you sort of uh, where to put your, uh, your off-diagonal entry. So more invariantly, it's a map from the fiber LZI to the fiber LZJ. It says that too. Um, 
OK. So we're making this connection by taking the push forward, but then we're kind of chopping it up along these walls, and we're gluing it back together. And we're gluing it back together with these kind of unipotent matrices um, with a particular combinatorial pattern that's determined by these labels. And now if you do that, it's a simple thing. Um, so now, how does that solve the problem of the monodromy? Um, well, let's just look. So, so let's take the monodromy now around one of these branch points. So the whole of my connection, without these extra gluings, it would have been just a matrix of this form, um, which is evidently not the identity. But now we're modifying it by sticking in these unipotent matrices, which so far I just told you that they're of this form. I didn't tell you what A, B, and C are. They're of that form. Well, OK, now if I require that that connection should actually be flat, so it means that the whole nomi around that loop, that's a contractible loop, so the whole nomi should be just the identity, that actually determines exactly what these A, A B, and C are. Um, uh, so in other words, there's a unique way, once I've fixed the spectral network, there's a unique way of pushing forward a connection and then re-gluing it to make a flat connection. Um, Uh, well, OK, not quite finished. So what about the place when the walls cross each other? Actually, this will now explain why my rule for defining the spectral network was what it was. So when the walls cross each other, remember we had this funny rule that a new wall has to be born there. Um, well, so I look at the whole enemy around this loop now, and I ask that that should be the identity. Um, that's some product of now five matrices. all up. Now they're all upper triangular in a common basis. Um, uh, these two are coming from the kind of incoming walls. And these three are coming from the outgoing walls. And this constraint just determines the outgoing ones in terms of the incoming ones. But once again, you have exactly enough freedom to make it work. You wouldn't have it if you didn't put that ik there. That has to do with the fact that, well, it has to do with the fact that these roots sum to another root. Or in other words, that these two matrix don't commute. That's what requires you to put this extra thing. This is actually related to the wall crossing formula in two dimensional physics. So in some sense, this formula is sort of part of Chakoti Vafo from a long time ago. Um, but here we're using it in sort of what looks like a different context. Um, OK. So, so OK, so what's the idea? So, so, so by this process of kind of cutting and gluing along the walls, um, we've defined a map where you start from an abelian connection over the covering, um, and you produce a non-abelian uh, connection over the, over the base. Um, and in fact, so both spaces, you know, the spaces of flat connections, so they both have a, uh, well, a symplectic structure or really a Poisson structure because we have this whole enomy, um around the, uh, around the uh, punctures. If you fix the whole enomy around the punctures, then you get the symplectic leaves. Um, and this map is actually a, a symplectomorphism. Um, well, why is that useful? Why do you care about having something like that? It's because, or at least partly because, these abelian connections are a real simple thing. So the moduli space of abelian connections over a torus um, to give you such a connection, I just have to give you the whole nomi around every homology class. Um, right? It factors, it descends from the fundamental group to just homology. So I just have to give you the, the whole nomi ar around every homology class. In other words, I just have to give you an element of a torus, C star to the n. So what we're getting here is a maps of C star to the n into the moduli space of uh, um, flat connections, um, which are local symplectomorphisms. So in other words, what you get is some local coordinate systems, which are very nice coordinate systems. They're local Darboux coordinate systems on the moduli of flat connections. Um, OK. So a spectral network gives you a kind of very canonical coordinate system on the moduli of, of flat connections. Yeah? OK, that's a, that's a that's like the coolest thing about it. Um, uh, <laughs> um, but maybe I don't have. Uh, so OK, the, the, there's a family. So I'm describing one map in one complex structure. But it really sits in a family. So if you think of this, these flat connections as being coming from solutions of Hitchin equations, then they're sitting naturally in a family of connections. And if you apply this procedure to that family of connections and take the limit where that family is going over to a Higgs bundle, this map smoothly limits to that map, to the sort of easy abelianization map that Hitchin uh, uh, studied. So this is kind of a way of extending that abelianization from Higgs bundles away to, uh, um, to, to flat connections. And for that purpose, it's very important to use exactly the spectral network that I described. You, know, you really have to use the one that's given by these differential equations and so on. Uh, I didn't think I would get to that in this talk, and so I don't have slides about it. Uh, yeah? What is theta? theta? Theta is the phase of the twister parameter. 
It, it, well, right. So these coordinates here, they don't directly depend on theta. They only depend on the network. Um, but if you want to do this, this family construction where you, you know, take a Higgs bundle and deform it to a family of connections, um, then if you want that abelianization to limit correctly to the one that you have for the Higgs bundle, then you have to choose this parameter theta to be the argument of the twister parameter. Well, lambda connections, but you could, I like to rather divide them by lambda and think of them as honest connections. But maybe I should, yeah, so this construction is somehow compatible with that, and that was an important part of the motivation, but it's not the part that I'm trying to, to do here. Uh, what do I have, like three minutes or something? Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, good. So, so, um, um, so, so as I say, so there's these canonical uh, coordinate systems um, which have some application. Uh, okay, they're, they have something to do with the counting of frame BPS states in physics. Um, they have to do with the wall crossing formula. Using these coordinate systems is one way of proving that the BPS counts I told you before actually obey the wall crossing formula. Um, and finally, you can use them for studying this hyperkähler metric. That's very roughly the application we were just discussing. Um, and they're also, I, I'm surprised I didn't write this, but they're also closely related to the cluster coordinate systems introduced by Fock and Gontrov. So in some special cases, they're exactly the coordinate systems studied by Fock and Gontrov. Um, okay. Uh, okay, so just very, very briefly, um, because this is the thing that uh, I'm presently most excited about. Um, everything I just said was about the moduli of flat connections over a, a, a surface, a two-manifold. But it seems, and this is work in progress, very much in progress with Dan Fried, um, that there's also a version for three manifolds. Um, and so in some sense, it's just a naive extension of what I just said. So you have a three manifold, you have a k-fold cover of that three manifold, and you have now some 3D version of a spectral network. So the walls are now two-dimensional things. Um, and once again, you can take GL1 connections over the, over the covering space upstairs and map them to GLK connections over the, over the thing downstairs. Um, uh, now, the, the one sort of surprising thing, or the one thing that's a little different from before, is that now the connections you use upstairs are not quite flat. Um, they have a kind of delta function curvature around some special co-dimension one, uh, sorry, co-dimension two loci. So in other words, a bunch of circles. Uh, we call them scars. They have to do with the places where the walls were hitting each other in the two-dimensional story. So in the two-dimensional story, that was non-generic. It happened kind of in co-dimension one in parameter space. But now, when you go up one dimension, that'll happen. Um, so you have to deal with it. And it turns out that the connections, the abelian connections that you study upstairs are flat, except there's some places where they have this special holonomy. There's a loop. There's a holonomy around that loop, which you call x. And then um, there's a holonomy also around the, uh, the sort of normal circle uh, uh, around that loop. And that holonomy is constrained to be 1 minus x. So it's a funny looking constraint. You have x and 1 minus x. But that's what makes the thing work. Um, and then, OK, so there's some example of triangulated hyperbolic three manifolds where, by this construction, you recover some things that were previously known about gluing equations. Um, and then, so just, I just want to state the conjecture because I think it's a, it's, a, uh, it's a kind of cool conjecture. So the conjecture is that this map actually uh, sort of commutes with Chern Simons in the following sense. Um, uh, the Chern Simons invariant, of the GLK Chern Simons invariant of the connection downstairs can be computed alternatively using its abelian version, the GL1 connection upstairs. Um, but with a very important correction, it's not just the GL1 Chern Simons theory, it's the GL1 Chern Simons theory plus the sum of the dialogues of the holonomies around those special loops. Um, that kind of deformed Chern Simons is well known in the topological string literature. I mean, it, it's, in some sense, it goes back to Witten. Oguri Vafa calculated this dialogue, and Jacobi Vafa used it in a context similar to this. And in fact, a similar equivalent has been proposed for quantum churn simons by Chakoti, Cordova, and Vafa. So here I'm just describing the kind of classical version of it where you can really calculate everything. And, uh, um, so yeah, I'm hopeful that, so this is absolutely a conjecture, but we're hopeful that it's, uh, that it's true and that we'll prove it to, uh, you know, by next year this time, let's say. Um, OK, I think that's it. So I, I've exceeded my, uh, OK, so yeah. Um, so that's it. There's the summation. Thank you very much. Can we 
you're asking, could you have gotten that without ever having a vector multiplet? Um, it doesn't seem a priori necessary. In fact, the way that we get it is through wall crossing between two things, neither of which is a vector multiplet. So you have two hypermultiplets. It just happens that they have symplectic pairing three. And that three leads to this representation theory of the three Kronecker quiver. So, so I would say not obviously. I mean, it's a true fact that that theory does happen to have a vector multiplet. So I don't have a counterexample, but, but I would guess that it's not essential. Yes. Uh, just, just a comment on that. Uh, so the BPS states of local P2, although there is no gauge theory description, they have this, so they, they have just hyper and then. For local P2. Uh, yeah, spin two and higher. Sounds good. <laughs> <laughs>